Okay. Nice to meet you anyway. Um, yeah. So again, my name is Jennifer and I'm a physical therapist. I work with Gentiva Home Health. Um, and again, as we kind of talked about, although um, it caught you at the end, uh, so again, we provide therapy services for people in the home. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, nursing. Um, we also do provide a bath aid. Um, while we have folks on service, what we tend to do is when we're overlapping with, you know, then we try to coordinate if we happen to be on a case with, with for example, with somebody like you folks, then um, we'll kind of coordinate that out, but we have those as options. Um, and so, again, we work with people like yourselves who, um, who have a really challenging time getting out of their home and being able to get to doctor's appointments where we have nursing services or, or being able to get out and go to therapy appointments. So kind of the, the challenges, can they go out and go to, for example, outpatient physical therapy to a clinic a couple of times a week? Or is that pretty taxing for them or painful or challenging because of their cognitive status, whatever it is. So um, so we're kind of the, your, your counterparts on that end. Um, and uh, thanks, Connie, for inviting me to do this because I love to do um, presentations um, with groups like this because uh, we do a lot of education opportunities. I coordinate a program within Gentiva. We call it Safe Strides. It's our Balance and Falls Prevention Program. And um, I do a lot of education and trainings to facilities and those kinds of things. And I love to get um, in with the folks who are really the ones <laughs> working directly with the clients and the residents. It used to be that we were just in there training with nursing directors and administrators and, and things. And um, we've really been, this last year or so, been really trying to get in um, with caregivers who are working with the same folks that we work with. And um, I think it's great because, of course, who better because you guys are the ones that really um, see these people. You see them on all their situations when, when you're helping them get out of bed, when you're helping them bathe, toilet, dress, go out to the car, to appointments. And so um, I think your role is critical in being able to kind of help figure out what their needs are and um, and how to advocate. I would say we're, we're kind of all team members for all of these folks, and whether it's Gentiva and Home Helpers or whatever agencies we all are, we're all really coordinating together to try and keep these folks safe in their homes and keep them from having to go to another living environment. And so I think it's great when we can coordinate on that and try and make sure that um, you're identifying or helping to identify maybe other services that need, just like the, the client I was talking about the other day where we're trying to find a, you know, a capacity to be able to get some private caregivers in, and you all might also be looking and saying, wow, I don't know, this person might also benefit from some things beyond what, what I'm doing here. So, um, love to get this information to you guys because, I, I, again, I think you're really the eyes and the ears of what's going on out there in our senior community with the people that you work with. So, um, I'm really informal. Please, um, Holler, bring up specific questions if you think of somebody that you're working with, or sometimes it's moms and dads and neighbors and aunts and uncles and stuff too. But um, if you have certain certain instances that you want to ask about, please feel free to holler. Um, and otherwise, I'll just I'll just talk. Um, I'm a huge fan of education, so what I try and do with this as I'm talking about balance and falls prevention is kind of give some background about why we see what we see. Um, I'm hoping to give you all some kind of ideas on. Um, what I call kind of the red flags, things that you want to keep on the lookout for as you're working with um, your clients that might be an indicator to you um, that maybe some other services are appropriate. And, um, and to kind of just have that in the back of your mind. And I think in order to be able to do that, we all kind of have to understand the, the way it works. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what manages, what controls our balance, why people have problems. Um, because I'm sure for a lot of you, um, most, if not all, of the clients you're probably working with have some balance dysfunction. Um, we see it all the time, and it's it's kind of neat because lately it's been really at the forefront of attention. We see a lot of um, community groups, and balance and fall prevention groups, like the senior centers run them. Um, there are funds that go nationally to fall prevention. It's kind of a neat um, thing right now, which is good because it's 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 huge, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, what it why it's huge. Um, I put a couple of statistics in here on the paper, only so you can see why why we all want to think about it and why programs like the one that, that I work with exist. Um, there's huge demand and huge need. So the first little section there, why is balance important? A couple of statistics. 30% of community dwellers over 65 fall each year. So by community dweller, that really is the people that um, 
you all would be working with in a lot of cases because they're people that live in their own homes, they're private residences. So a third of all individuals over 65 fall each year, and 40% of those individuals over 80 fall each year. Uh, when we start to talk about what we call institutionalized, and by that I mean like in an assisted living facility, adult family home, skilled nursing home, 66% of our um, seniors fall each year, so two thirds. That's just huge, I mean that's a huge number. Um, when you think of, you know, yeah, for every 10 people in the room, you know, six to seven of them are going to fall because unfortunately then what we see is that they don't, sometimes they just fall and get back up, but a lot of times they fall and then they fracture a hip or they fracture a shoulder, they get a head injury. Um, something happens that makes them end up in the hospital and the nursing home and they are never able to make it back to where they want to be at home. So what we've really tried to do um, is to more proactively approach this. It used to be that as a physical therapist, I was called in all the time after somebody had a fall and after they were in the hospital for their fractured hip and they had their hip replacement and we were coming back to rehab them. And now what we're trying to do is, um, because if we can just prevent even one of those falls, it, it's, a, it's a huge thing for at least that person or that family. And if we can prevent that, um, then that's great. And again, that's why we're kind of hoping to get everybody on board with things to look for is like indicators for that. And it's, it's a tough sell because I'll tell you, even when we're working with physicians and uh, providers in the community, a lot of them still have and still dispense kind of the, um, the information that, well, you know what, you're over 70 and you're just going to fall. You know, you're just going to be unsteady and you're just going to fall and maybe go pick up a walker or a cane and be careful. And um, I'm here to say that that doesn't have to be the way. And even though a lot of people, as we see by the statistics, do fall, it's it's not a, I, 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 I say using the age card, it doesn't have to be that way. We have a lot of seniors who don't fall and um, and do well and who um, improve their balance function. So it, it doesn't have to be that way. So I don't like that to be an excuse. Um, yes, it's true a lot of them do fall because they're a lot of the different systems we have going on in our body degenerate, but it doesn't have to be that way. So. Um, People benefit, we see it all the time. Our program, we have these great statistics because you can see that you start here and you end there. And this is people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s that go through a program and their fall risk is lower. So it, it, they can benefit and they can improve. Um, a couple of other things on here that we'll just touch on. 70% of emergency room visits by people over 75 are because of falls. Uh, balance related falls account for 50% of accidental deaths. Um, again, usually that's because when people fall and they get an injury and then they just kind of have that bad sequence of events, you know, they end up with pneumonia, which is the most typical kind of situation and, and end up passing from some kind of complication like that. Um, I have one statistic on there about uh, each year nearly 8 million individuals visit their physician for treatment of dizziness. We'll talk a little bit about dizziness because dizziness is closely related to falls and it all happens in here in the inner ear, which we're going to spend some time talking about. Uh, the last little bullet point there, uh, diabetic peripheral <coughs> myopathy. We'll talk about this later also, but um, you know, diabetes is kind of, I would say it's kind of our, it's a big epidemic right now. I mean, there's just so many people uh, diagnosed with diabetes and um, the statistic is that every person that has diabetes will develop what we call diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Um, Peripheral neuropathy is when people get changes because of the, the sugars and, and the way it changes your circulation and feeding the body. Um, they get changes in the nerves that go through their body. And so with peripheral neuropathy, we see it uh, primarily in the hands and feet, primarily the feet, and that's where I'm most focused on because I'm thinking about balance. Um, but people will, will they'll have numbness, they'll have burning, um, pins and needles, kind of those feelings like when your foot's asleep and you wake up on it, or it can be the opposite of when you actually have no feeling and it feels like you just don't even know what's going on in your foot. So um, every person with diabetes will get peripheral neuropathy, and when you have peripheral neuropathy, you're 15 times more likely to fall. So we always say every person with a diagnosis of diabetes needs to be thought of as really a red flag fall risk because um, if they're not right now, they're just the odds are <laughs> that, that over time it's going to develop. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in another section, but I just wanted to bring that up as an introduction. So, um, again, I'm going to get into a little bit on, on what controls balance. Um, again, like I said, I'm, I, I love education. I think you have to kind of have it make sense in order for it to stick in your brain. And I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about what controls balance, why balance might go bad. Um, I think there's, well, I see it all the time that there's somewhat of a misconception that people 
fall because they're weak. Their legs are weak. I hear it from the physicians or the providers. I hear it from my clients. Um, I'm weak, my legs are wobbly, and I fall. And although I will agree that a lot of times when I strength test them, they do have some weakness because they have decreased their activity level. But for most people, strength is not the reason they're falling. It's not helping them, but, but it's not probably the primary reason that they're falling. Um, and so as a physical therapist, I can sit and a lot of times I can have them do all the leg kicks at the counter I want, do all the leg strengthening, and it's not going to hurt them by any means, but I might not be getting at the root of the problem. And so I might see them and do a whole bunch of strengthening and a whole bunch of um, gait training, you know, with a walker or a cane and send them on their way and they're going to be at just as high of a fall risk because I haven't addressed what's going on with the systems that do regulate balance that we're going to talk about. So in a nutshell, the three systems that control balance um, are um, eyes, ears, and feet. And I'll just talk a little bit about how each of those, what each of those contributes and what you might see if they're having kind of dysfunction or problems in any of those areas. Um, so with eyes, um, when I look, I'm not looking at so much at, you know, like when you go to the eye doctor and you're, you're doing a vision test, you know, if I can read the letters that are going across the chart. I'm not so concerned about somebody's clarity of vision or what their prescription of their eyeglasses is, but um, I'm thinking more about what we call gaze stabilization. And gaze stabilization is there's this really close link, at least nerve-wise, between your eyes and the way they track, so kind of the way they move back and forth and what's going on in the inner ear, which we're going to spend some time talking about, but that's kind of where our key balance system is. And, um, and they're closely related, so I can kind of see what's going on. So when, for example, when I turn my head really quick, I can still keep you guys in pretty good focus. A little bit of blurriness, but not bad. I can keep you guys really pretty clear because I have good gaze stabilization, as all of us probably do in this room. You know when you have somebody that has a camcorder and they're doing a um, movie and they turn really quick and you want to throw it because it moves because it's all a blur. Um, video cameras don't have very good gaze stabilization, probably get better, but, but they don't. So when, when you move it, it can't keep up with the tracking and so it just blurs. And, um, and gaze stabilization is something that again stays strong when our balance system is strong and so when it gets weak, people will start to have a breakdown of that and so when they turn their head quickly, they might not keep you guys all in focus like I'm doing right now. And so they turn their head and everything's a blur and you know what it's like, everything becomes a blur and it's kind of like, ugh, kind of funny feedback and it makes you feel not very stable on your feet because we use our eyes so much for, for visual information. So. Um, when I do a balance assessment on somebody, I'm looking at things that are going on with their eyes. Are they able to hold a point? So like I said, if I look really, you know, if I look at your face and turn my head really quick, I can keep you really focused. A lot of people, their eyes are going everywhere that their head's moving, and I know that their gaze stabilization isn't very good. Um, it's really cool because I can actually do exercises to help that, just like I can strengthen the biceps. I can strengthen that system with some exercises. Um, not necessarily something that you would pick up on on day-to-day -day things when working with your clients. You might, they might talk about just what I described, turning and having a lot of blurriness. They might talk about um, double vision or bouncy vision. When people talk about that, that kind of comes, that kind of triggers something for me when they tell me something like um, that it is blurry, that it's double, things are kind of moving around <laughs> on the walls. Um, and that that's an indication that they have a disconnect kind of between what's going on with their eyes and their, their balance system. Um, so that's something I look at and we end up doing a ton of exercises with people. It's kind of funny because they say, well, I'm falling and it's my legs and here we are doing all these you know, eye exercises, <laughs> but <laughs> there's a method usually to our madness. So, um, so that's one thing I look at. We know that for most of our um, seniors, and again, as a home health therapist, just like I'm, I would imagine for most of your clients, I mean, we work with the senior population. I mean, that's going to be... 90 some percent of our group, you know, we're not really working with people too often below that that senior age. But so for our senior population, we also see that they tend to become quite visually dependent for some reason out of these three systems, eyes, ears, feet, that we use. For some reason, we seem to gravitate toward vision as we age and we tend to want to shift and rely on it the most, which um, isn't a horrible thing except that <laughs> for most of us, we have a lot of people do have kind of degradation of different vision systems within. We get a lot of macular degeneration, glaucoma, 
cataracts, and those kinds of things that change depth and contrast and all that can affect our balance. Um, we see this and we know it because when I go in and ask somebody when they fall, a lot of times they tell me that they fall at night when they're getting up to go to the bathroom. Um, so it's dark and um, they don't have their house well lit, they don't turn night lights or anything like that, and they get up to go to the bathroom and they don't have good visual input and they fall. So I know that they're relying on their vision when they shouldn't necessarily be doing that. Um, again, we can do some things to kind of shift. There's some different exercises where we can kind of get them to try not to rely so much on their vision, but to rely on these other systems. But, um, but we just see it and it just tends to be a trend. It's what our bodies do. Our brains and our bodies are incredible the way they manage something, but it's our, the, the way that we manage ourselves. But that's one area where we kind of, not our smartest move, but anyway. Um, so if you see people that have maybe a really difficult time in the dark, whether it's if you happen to be with them at nighttime dark hours, or you hear them talk a lot about um, being out at night, and especially we see it all the time, night trying to go across their driveway or grass or something, because then you get um, hit doubly because you get funny surfaces and dark. It's a really classic time when people fall. Um, again, something that they kind of have some visual dependence and um, maybe trying to use their eyes more than they should. So, so those are a couple things I think of when I look at, at their eyes and what, what contributions that has. Um, feet, what we're thinking about with feet is, um, you can kind of again imagine, I mean, our, our feet are our connection to the ground, to the surface. And so we get a ton of information about what's going on underneath us through our feet. Part of that is just kind of feeling pressure light touch, sharp things, that kind of thing, you know, if we step on a tack. But a lot of it also is feeling um, my ankles are a huge contributor to my balance. And if you ever pay attention when you're doing something and you're off balance, you'll really notice that your ankles are moving a lot, trying to keep you balanced. And it's one of our major strategies with balance um, is information through our ankles. And we have receptors in there, and they should pick stuff up. Like if I am going up a hill, you know, and my ankles are bent this way, um, I should get good signals to my brain saying, well, she's going up a hill, stabilize these other muscles so she doesn't keep going forward. <clears throat> when my ankles are bent the other way because I'm going down a hill, should send information saying, okay, going down a hill, stabilize so she just doesn't fall backwards. Um, or if I'm on uneven surfaces where I'm kind of, my feet aren't just nice and solid like gravel, sand, grass, again, that information all feeds up to my brain. So, um, so we test, as in therapy, we test all those things, you know, and see if they can tell, make sure that they can tell or their, or their ankles are telling them um, if they're tilted sideways, up or down. So we look at that, but um, the other thing we look at is what is their sensation like? And we do little tests where we poke the foot with these little teeny filaments and see if they have numbness or not. Kind of relating back to that point I brought up about the peripheral neuropathy that we see with, with folks with diabetes. Um, and so I like to see some people aren't in touch with it. I'll say, how are your feet? Fine, no problems. And I go to test them, and they can feel zero out of the 10 points, which means, no, their feet actually aren't okay. I mean, they can feel big things, you know, if I slug them with a sledgehammer, but, <laughs> but they're not feeling what, what the Diabetic Association considers what you need to have for protective sensation. Um, and so some of them are right on top of it. They say, yeah, I'm numb. Um, and these are a lot of things that you guys might pick up on or, or that your clients might tell you about. Um, because, again, I think that you're having a lot of time where you might be helping them shoes and socks, you might be helping them with bathing, um, and they have a lot of opportunity to complain about their feet. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so those are some things to think about, too. If somebody's talking about, again, burning, stabbing, pins and needles in their feet, it's just like if your foot's asleep and then we say, okay, let's get up and go, and you go to take those first steps on it, it feels funny. It does not feel very good. And you don't feel very stable until you can kind of work it out. Well, some folks with neuropathy, and it's not always from diabetes. You can have neuropathy from other things that aren't from diabetes, but that's where we mostly see it. So that's the example I bring up. Um, they feel that all the time. It, 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 it's not that it goes and gets comes every so often. It just matters how bad it is. You know, it's always there. Um, so a little thing to kind of file back again, if you're having somebody complain about that, imagine they might not be very stable, especially because it's probably not the only thing going on. You know, they probably have that in addition to some other things. So when they're talking about pain in their feet, burning, stabbing, numbness, um, and you can always be on the lookout, I always say, you know, I don't know that feet are any of our favorite thing, especially um, feet. <laughs> feet tend to really, I think, indicate a lot about a person's health. and. Um, 
you know, especially with circulation disorders and diabetes and those kinds of things, um, you know, when you're there and you see somebody that has the really big, thick toenails, things like that, that's an indication. They, they probably don't have real good um, health of a lot of their circulation system and things like that. Um, probably an indicator that maybe their feet are feeling okay, but there's a good chance they're having some weird things going on. A lot of swelling and edema usually interferes with um, what they can sense and what they can feel in their feet. So those are things you just want to say. I would say the health of the feet is really, you know, an indication when you see real poor looking skin and nails and that kind of thing, I just, you know, usually indicate something to me about kind of their general health status. So um, so that's just something you might hear from some of your clients that might be, again, another, another red flag. Um, and then the last system, so again, so we did eyes, we did feet, we'll do inner ear. I would say that because it's the one that uh, really is the primary um, regulator. I'll say it's the one that I think most people tend to know the least about. And it's the most interesting, I think. So um, in the inner ear, and you, you might have heard it, we frequently call it the vestibular system or the inner ear balance system, and people kind of refer to it in different ways. But you know, in the ear, um, it's a small area, and there's a lot going on. There's an incredible amount going on in this very small area. And you know, we have hearing, um, and then beyond the hearing, a little bit further in is, is what we call the inner ear. And um, that's where we house our balanced vestibular system. And people will tell me, I'll, I'll say, well, I'm going to think a little bit about what's going on in your ear. And they'll, of course, say, yeah, I'm kind of hard of hearing. And um, I kind of take that with a grain of salt. They're two different systems. They might correlate, and it might not. So just because you're hard of hearing doesn't mean your balance is affected. And if your balance is affected, it doesn't mean your hearing is affected. So I kind of take it for what they say and uh, nod, because usually they want to tell me it's, you know, their hearing has changed over the last six months. And that's all great, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So in that inner ear system, it's pretty neat. Uh, that's a system that tells our brain, again, all of this is information that feeds to our brain, and then our brain tells our body what to do. So the inner ear system feeds to our brain and tells us pretty much what is going on with our head and kind of our body position with relation to our environment. So what's going on in there is there's these little tubes, kind of like little rubber tubes, you know, little, and they have fluid in them. And they're, they're, they're oriented kind of in these circles. And they have this fluid in them, and when we move, the fluid goes around, and when it goes around, it sends a signal to our brain and says what we're doing. So when I lean forward like this, the fluid in this little canal that's oriented here goes around, sends a signal to my brain, says she's tipping forward. Again, maybe stabilize some of these muscles so she doesn't just fall down. Or I turn to the right, fluid goes around in a different set of canals, tells my brain, She's looking to the right, stabilize over here so she doesn't fall over. And, uh, and it's really neat, and it works really well for those of us who are active, at least fairly active, and mobile. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a neat system. So, and when we're strong, and the, the, that system stays strong by movement. So when I'm moving my head a lot, normal activity for most of us, it stays strong, just like when I use my arms for my daily activity, my biceps stay strong or my quads stay strong. My inner ear system stays strong by movement, um, specifically head movement, but usually most any type of movement. So you can imagine little kids running around, man, their system is getting bad tons. You know, they're doing somersaults, they're playing on that merry-go-round. They don't get nauseous from roller coaster rides, and they could spin all day long, and they don't get sick. It doesn't bother them. Their system is so incredibly strong that you can assault it with anything, and, and they don't get dizzy. They don't get funny feelings like that. And um, as we age, even really, I think, you know, um, into our 30s, I mean, I was trying to think, and, and I do these kind of exercises with people all the time, and I know when I got into my 30s, you know, I was having a hard time at amusement parks. I was starting to get much more reactive to, you know, roller coasters and twirling and stuff than I used to be. Um, because we're just, we're still active, but we're not the same active as when you're five. Um, so now we look at our folks that we all work with, and what is their level of activity? Well, I don't know about you guys, but most of the people I work with, I'm happy to get them out of a chair, <laughs> um, out of a bed, maybe taking a walk. And if they do take a walk, most of them are not real mobile with it. They're maybe walking with a walker, and they're walking like this. And when you say, hi, Mabel, they kind of turn, oh, hi. You know, they're not looking around, oh, hi, it's a beautiful day, look at the birds in the trees, and, 
you know, bending down. They're not moving very much. So again, if they're walking, they're walking stiff. I call it this on guard, on block posture. When they turn, they don't look like this. They kind of do a whole body turn. They're not moving their head. So again, we're happy to get them out of the chair. And if they do get out of the chair, it's still pretty limited for the most part. Certainly not what we were seeing earlier in life. And again, for most of us, we're dealing with people who have had some situation where they are moving even less so than another typical 60, 70, 80 year old. So their system is not being stimulated. It's just like if I roped their arms to their side, their biceps are going to completely degenerate. Um, so now they have a system in their inner ear where it's very weak, just like a muscle system. It's not a muscle, but it's weak, just like we would lose a, a muscle system. And, uh, and it becomes kind of sensitive. So if they ever did have to turn quick, you can imagine if you have the system that doesn't give very much input, and then, um, wow, an alarm went off or something went off, and they did turn their head, and that fluid went around, which never happens to them, whoo, kind of sends a crazy signal to their brain because they're, they're so used to non-stimulus that that's a huge signal. So to them, actually, that little bit of movement probably to them feels like they just did a full spin and, you know, they're kind of holding on. Um, so a huge thing you see, um, and, and I think this is really classic, and I, and I think it's a huge area for us to look at and for you guys to be um, tuned into, is um, what happens when they're moving their head and you're with them. And so, for example, uh, a lot of things that we see, if they happen to be reaching up into a shelf in the closet, bathroom, something, they go to reach up, you do that little bit of head movement. For a lot of them, that little bit of head movement gets them to do a little stutter step. Now, mine might even be exaggerated. It might be even more subtle than mine. Um, so you really have to watch for it. But anytime you see a little bit of that kind of, um, come on, there's one up here if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> I told the last one was a bad <laughs> um, So anytime you see a little bit of what I call kind of compensation movement, so again, if they look up, and they kind of catch themselves. If they look sideways, and they kind of do a little stutter step. And again, it could be much more subtle than I'm even saying. I'd love it to be that, then you really know. But sometimes, it's just that. That is a huge indicator that they're having inner ear weakness. That system in their ear is weak. And so when they go to turn their head or move, they're having to catch themselves because it's throwing them off balance, just that little bit of movement. So one of the big things I think and really the biggest, I think one of the, the biggest things that, that when I'm working with groups is, is watch for things like that. When they're sitting in a chair and maybe they bend over to um, put on a sock, put on a shoe, reach for something under, um, <laughs> if they either describe to you or actually kind of physically almost do kind of come out, a lot of them will say, whoa, I thought I was just going to keep going right over. Um, again, that's an inner ear thing. They are bending their head and they are getting a perception of movement when they're not moving. Um, that means something's going on in their inner ear they're being extra sensitive to. A great indicator for, for fall risk. Um, like I said, every time you move your head, and you can even try this a little bit, just do it safely, but you know, if you're, if you're standing there and, and you happen to see, you know, be with one of your clients and, and you know, just a touch, you know, look over and kind of see how they respond. Um, again, we, they should be pretty solid because what we know is if, they're, if they get a little bit of of um, shuffle or a little bit of change in their movement from that. When something big comes up, they could totally, it could be the one that, you know, one time and they do a sidestep and they fall down and, and we have a fractured hip. So um, that's, a, that's a huge thing, I think, to look for. Does that kind of make sense how that works? Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, and it's kind of neat, again, the great thing about it is it doesn't mean that's where they're at. We can, we can strengthen that system again, just like we strengthen muscle systems, like the biceps or the quads. We can do exercises for that system and get them stronger so that now when they turn their head or look up or look down, um, they don't get those movements. Um, I, I was thinking in the summertime, we go with this huge amount of referrals for people that are always laughing. It's like when, when it starts to get nice enough to pull the hoses out and they start to want to reach down and um, pick up their hoses and sprinklers and they fall down. And, that's always a big thing <laughs> when, when summer starts because they start moving more. So um, the other thing that, that I want to refer to when we're talking about the inner ear is dizziness. I know we all brought up and Connie was talking initially about a uh, client that was really, um, really sensitive to dizziness. Um, dizziness can be a result of a couple of different things. Um, primarily the three areas that we see dizziness associated with are um, medications. You guys probably know too, almost every medication these days has a side effect of dizziness. 
um, blood pressure issues. Again, typically if, you know, if they're on blood pressure medications and they do a change in position, like lying down to sitting up or sitting up to standing, they get that lightheadedness. Um, so that's kind of related to their blood pressure. Their blood pressure meds may or may not be appropriately set. I always think that's good for the doctors to know because they might be able to adjust them. It might be optimized, but it might not be. And then the third reason is inner ear uh, dysfunction. Again, just the thing, the, the inner ear weakness like what we talk about. So again, I might be working with this client who, when they look up, I'll do this all the time, we'll be walking down a hall, I'll say, okay, look left, you know, as they're walking, good, look right, look up, look down. If they report to me any dizziness with that, or again, lightheadedness, funny feelings in the head, that's not dizziness that's medication related because that doesn't come out of the blue. It's not blood pressure related because that's not when we see blood pressure related dizziness. That's when they're moving their head. That's inner ear. And so, on. Um, again, it's because their system is sensitive. It's weak. And so now when I'm getting them to move it, that fluid's going around in there, giving them a little bit bigger hit than they're usually with, than they're usually, and, and it's kind of causing this conflict in their in their brain, and so to them they feel like it's a lot of movement when it's a little bit. So when, when they talk to me about dizziness with movement, I'm really thinking inner ear. And again, it's great because I can do exercises to get through that. So um, another great thing to file back in your bank on um, dizziness, especially with head movement, body movements. I always say the, sit, the, the, the coming up from laying down or sit to stand really um, we end up doing a lot of trying to tease that out because, again, that really could be blood pressure and it could be inner ear. And I don't really have a good idea for that unless I sit down and kind of do some testing and we'll take blood pressure readings and all of that. But, but so if somebody has dizziness when they're going from lying down to sitting up, I don't assume it's blood pressure, which I think a lot of people do, and I don't assume it's inner ear. I think you just have to do a little bit more testing. But if you're seeing that, just know um, it might be blood pressure and that's probably what they'll say and it's probably what their family members will say and it might be, but it might be inner ear stuff also. So just to kind of keep in the back of your brain. Vertigo, so spinning when the whole world, so not so much lightheadedness, but when the world feels like it's spinning and you're holding on, um, is another thing we end up working with um, within our, our kind of program and treatment. Uh, typically, when somebody's truly spinning, it is related to some inner ear dysfunction. In this case, you have a funny little thing where there's these little crystals that are in those little canals. and. If one comes loose, it spins around and it gives people this perception of spinning, especially with movement. And um, there's some very specific treatment that you have to do with that. Again, I can do all the strengthening and all the other stuff. If I don't do a very specific treatment with that, then we're not going to get to the bottom of that. So if somebody talks about true spinning, again, another big, big red flag you'd want to think about, um, kind of a therapy assess on that to see if it's this inner ear dysfunction where the this little crystal comes loose and wreaks havoc. Is that the kind too, or it's like, it seems like the world is the pink, and then like that? Yeah, well, um, and that might be different. I mean, the spinning part is like, you know, where you're kind of holding on to your bed or your chair, because okay. it's going to dump you off, and, and people will really feel, I mean, they, when they get it, they are holding, they are gripping that, uh, those arms of yeah. that chair. Because there's one where it's like, kind of, like, flops. She did that, or that's what she described? No, that's what I do. Oh, oh you'll do it. So that, no, I have a lot of inner ear issues, so I'm recognizing Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I can almost be an example for you. Oh, shoot, we should have, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We need, a ta we need a table here. Um, but yeah, so, so when you have, I always say, any type of thing, frequently, those types of symptoms, lightheadedness, um, faint feeling, spinning, are related to what goes on in the inner ear. So, um... But like I said, a lot of times there, there are things we can do about it, so it doesn't just have to be that way. So, what about um, flashing lights trigger? That's I know that's a Meniere's trigger. Yeah, so. it can be, and typically a uh, and typically a migraine trigger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think of light things. Yeah, exactly. A lot with a lot with migraine and and Meniere's, which both again have vertigo connections. Absolutely. Um, one of the things then we also um, do is kind of try and figure out how these people coordinate all those systems together. So we have these three systems we talked about, and then we really try and figure out, again, like we talked about at the beginning, when are they visually dependent? Um, we can look and see, are they, some people are visually dependent, like we talked about, some people we find out are kind of surface dependent, um, but it's kind of neat because what we'd like their bodies to do is to pick when it's dark. Hopefully the brain's gonna say, okay, don't listen so much to what's going on here, let's listen to the information here and the information here. 
and when it's when I'm walking in thick sand well okay kind of listen down here but shift and use the eyes and the inner ear and, and we all do that again without thinking about it it just happens magically in our bodies it's great again for a lot of our, our seniors especially ones that have been down lower activity um, that system falls apart but again we can kind of do some retraining with it and kind of get them brain retrain um, to to take on and kind of learn which ones to listen to and, and when you have your eyes closed, quit trying to use your vision. <laughs> yeah, it's just, guess what? It's not working. So we do a lot where we have low light, or we just have them close their eyes to simulate low light. And if they free fall, which a lot of them do, you know, we'll put them in a position of a narrow base, um, close their, you know, they can sit here like this and they can hold it pretty well. You tell them to close their eyes and they free fall in one second. They are visually dependent. I don't want them to be like that because there are going to be times when it's going to be dark, and I don't want them trying to use their vision. I need them listening to what's going on in here. So we can do some neat things with that and, and actually treat it. It's, it's, um, it's kind of fun. They don't like it very much because we put them in situations where they feel not very steady, but mm -hmm. people benefit from it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so that's a lot of what, you know, well, a lot of what we do, which again, um, as Connie said, it's kind of neat. We have, you know, we have a program at Gentiva where we look at this. So when I come in as a physical therapist, I'm, of course, always looking at strength and range of motion and how they transfer and how they walk. But if they're a fall risk and I'm seeing that or somebody has keyed me into that they had a fall or something like that, then I really want to go in and I want to be looking at all three of these systems. And I'm going to follow up with a pretty thorough assessment looking at those three systems. Because like I said, so you can kind of see now, I can look at their strength and say, wow, their quads are weak. And I can do all the leg strengthening until the cows come home. That is not going to help if I have inner ear weakness that triggers when they move their head. I gotta get their head moving, and I have to start doing some safe, kind of regulated exercises to get things going up here, because I can get their legs as strong as they want, and if they're still the first time they happen to move their head fast, it sends them reeling over to the side, that's not gonna matter. So that's what's kind of neat um, about being able to really hone in on this and really try and get to kind of the root of the, the problem. So, um, you guys have been through